welcome everyone to the Common Good Project's conversation series on what is the common good. My name is Ryan Mead and I'm the convener for this series and I'm joined today uh, with, by my co-convener Chris Conway and thank you for uh, joining today. We have a very interesting uh, discussion which is subtitled Vindicating Mary Wollstonecraft's Rights, the Priority of Duty, Virtue, and the Common Good. Uh, before uh, Chris introduces our guest scholar today, I just want to remind everyone of the format that uh, after introductions, we will have uh, uh, some opening remarks. And in this case, uh, our guest scholar today has prepared a paper, uh, and then we will have a conversation on the topic. Uh, you should feel free to enter questions into the chat box. We will leave about 10 minutes for questions and we'll attempt to get to as many questions as we can. If we can't get to all the questions, uh, uh, we will use them for future programming, but we strongly encourage you to put, put questions in the, in the chat box. As always, I'd, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Law as well as Blackfriars Hall and the Aquinas Institute for uh, co-hosting this event. So with that, Chris. Today, our guest scholar is Erica Bakiaki, uh, who is the director of the Wollstonecraft Project as part of the Abigail Adams Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is a senior fellow. She is also a fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and she is the author of the soon to be published book, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision. Along with being the editor of two books, uh, she is the author of several law review articles, principally focused on equal protection jurisprudence in US constitutional law. Her writings generally treat jurisprudence, equality, and feminism, and have appeared in The Atlantic, The Claremont Review of Books, and First Things, among many other publications. She is unique among our guest scholars in having co-founded a school, uh, the St. Benedict Classical Academy in Natick, Massachusetts, for early form education, utilizing insights from the classical trivium as its foundation and a contemporary version of the Quadrivium. She served as the school's president for several years. Erica received a BA from Middlebury College, an MA in theology from Boston College, and her law degree from Boston University. She has previously served as a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Erica. And uh, I also want to thank you for serving on our advisory board, and we appreciate the, the work that you've done in, in helping us shape many of the ideas in this series. Um, as we begin today's discussion, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you've prepared a paper vindicating Mary Wollstonecraft's rights so that we have plenty of time for discussion. I will turn it over to you for your paper. Thank you. And I want to just thank you both for all that you've done. Um, it's been a really wonderful series. I've learned so much. I'm anticipating many, many more um, really exciting, interesting um, uh, presentations. Uh, I've learned so much. So thank you for having me. Um, so those listening to our conversation today who have just a passing acquaintance with Mary Wollstonecraft's thought can be forgiven for wondering how she has anything to do with duty, virtue, or the common good. After all, wasn't she just a female version of the radical liberal Thomas Paine? That is a French revolutionary who simply extended to women late 18th century appeals for the rights of men. And in her duel with Edmund Burke over the same, wasn't it he in his critique of abstract rights in favor of English traditions that the reign of terror so clearly vindicated? To put more of a fine point on it, how could the short-lived wife of the anarchist, William Godwin, teach us anything about the common good? And it is true for more than 200 years, Wollstonecraft has been both scorned and lionized for her rather complicated political and romantic associations. It's only very recently that she has been recognized as a canonical philosopher in her own right. And as it turns out, when you actually read her early work, especially one steeped deeply in the Aristotelian tradition. So though I will not be recommending her for sainthood, I do wanna hardly recommend her as one who can teach us important truths about rights and the priority of duties, virtue, and the common good. Indeed, I wanna argue in this presentation as I do in my forthcoming book, that the account of rights she offers in her most famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, unsystematic though it may be, can serve as a crucial corrective to modern natural rights theories, theories that have tended to undermine thinking about and acting with a view toward the common good. 
And I want to argue that this is especially true when it comes to those common goods that have been under particular assault since at least the sexual revolution, marriage and the child rearing family. In a word, the culturally essential character shaping work of the home. I think that Wollstonecraft can especially help us to understand the common good today because the case she made for women's rights in 1792 was based not upon liberal conceptions of pre-political autonomous man, and I do mean man, as uh, today's claims for rights tend to be. Rather, her case was grounded in the common human nature men and women share, a nature she understood to be ordered to wisdom and virtue, human excellences that took their bearing in her thought from the singular wisdom and goodness of God. So while it is very true to say that Wollstonecraft sought to make use of the revolution in political thinking that had taken root in America and then in France in the late 18th century to include women in political efforts to secure the rights of man. Even a cursory reading of the rights of women reveals that the treatise was not chiefly concerned with rights at all. Rather, Wollstonecraft was concerned most especially with the advance of moral and intellectual virtue in both persons and societies. An advance that would be best realized where our politics and laws, she thought, shaped around the common human dignity of each person. Persons are equal in dignity, thought Wollstonecraft, because each one, whatever his or her starting point, is a rational creature capable of moral development. The political freedom she sought through Republican government then was at the service of the moral development of each person which consisted in large measure of virtuously fulfilling the ordinary duties of life. Law for Wollstonecraft then ought not be employed to promote natural or inherited inequalities, nor to maintain the strong and rich in their positions, as she believed the aristocratic societies of her time unjustly did. Rather, the purpose of both law and government was to encourage progress and virtue for each and every person, rich or poor, man or woman. For human beings, attainment of virtue, not their attainment of property, wealth, or status, would guarantee personal, f f uh, familial, and societal happiness. And so though she agreed with Hobbes that men were often quite brutish, with Rousseau that society grew out of man's perfectibility, and with Locke that a main purpose of government was to protect each person's God-given rights, she did not believe any of this required a mythical state of nature to discern. Importantly, neither did she believe that these natural states conceived so dissimilarly by Hobbes and Rousseau, for instance, explained human nature accurately. Rather, human beings are rational creatures created by and dependent upon God who require moral education and practice and self-mastery to perfect their given dispositions in order to achieve their end. Imitation of God through contemplation of the truth and benevolence toward others. Wollstonecraft's philosophical case was robust, grounded in what she took to be the unalterable truth about God and the wondrous capacities of his human creation. Human beings are endowed with the ennobling capacity to reason, quote, to rise in excellence by the exercise of powers implanted for that purpose, end quote. This capacity is, of course, what makes us distinct from the animals, quote, in what respect are we superior to the brute creation? If intellect is not allowed to be the guide of passion, brutes hope and fear, love and hate, but without a capacity to improve, a power of turning these passions to good or evil, they neither acquire virtue nor wisdom. Why? Because the creator has not given them reason, end quote. Thus the ultimate purpose of every human life is to use one's own reason to submit to the quote, unerring reason of God, to conform oneself to the nature of things as God has benevolently designed them. And, to, and thus to enfold one's human faculties in order to better oneself and to be of service to others. Goodness has but one eternal standard, God, and thus all his creatures, regardless of sex or social status, are responsible to that single standard. Quote, the only solid foundation for morality appears to be the character of the supreme being. For to love God as the fountain of wisdom, goodness, and power appears to be the only worship useful to a being who wishes to acquire either virtue or knowledge. Wollstonecraft believed that the inculcation of good intellectual and moral habits at a young age would allow the person to become free with earned independence of mind and the capacity to virtuously fulfill his or her duties. 
self-determination and agency, as we call them today, would be achieved then through growth in wisdom and virtue, one by way of sustained intellectual and moral formation, and dynamically circumscribed by one's familial and social obligations. Such a course would allow one to choose day by day with increasing freedom and independence against self-regard and mediocrity for a life uniquely one's own, dedicated to human excellence, whatever one's personal circumstance or station in life. She writes most paradoxically to our modern ears, quote, the being who discharges the duties of its station is independent. But such personal freedom and independence does not spring forth organically from the child. One must be taught, desires must be schooled, the familial environment and society in which one lives must encourage each person's intellectual and moral development. And so she especially praised the work of parents and teachers, those who, quote, prepare young people to encounter the evils of life with dignity, to acquire wisdom and virtue by the exercise of their own faculties, end quote. Indeed, her advice in this regard to parents was plentiful. Quote, if you wish to make your son rich, pursue one course. If you are only anxious to make him virtuous, you must take another. But do not imagine that you can bound from one road to the other without losing your way, end quote. From the person's given nature as a rational, moral, and social being sprang forth certain discernible obligations to self, family, society, and God. Civil and political rights were derived, therefore, not from theoretical ruminations about a mythical state of nature, but from actual moral duties to others. A good and just government enabled and encouraged the fulfillment of each person's concrete duties, in part through the protection of her rights. A person must be free to pursue the right course of action. And rights were not absolute. Thinking of parents' duties to their children, especially, she says, those who do not fulfill the duty can forfeit the right. Because political and civil institutions were properly in the service of these prior human duties, any institution that obstructed their proper fulfillment ought to be reconstituted with more these more authentic human ends in mind. Quote, I mean, therefore, to infer that the society is not properly organized, which does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties by making it the only way to acquire that countenance from their fellow creatures, which every human being wishes some way to attain." End quote. So what were these duties that characterized rational creatures, according to Wollstonecraft? First, duties to self, to develop one's rational faculties and to master one's appetites to family, to care for one's dependent children, spouse, and elderly parents, to fellow creatures, to be useful in one's work and to respect the human dignity of all others, regardless of social status, and to God, to pursue truth and goodness and to trust in his providential designs. As I'll say about more in a bit here, because Wollstonecraft viewed the affectionate inculcation of virtue in children to be among the most essential of all social duties, she regarded motherhood and fatherhood to be the very highest of callings. The duty of the rational creature to seek the truth is the principle that underlie Wollstonecraft's tolerance of religious pluralism and her sympathy with a dissenting sex in Britain at, at, at her time. Still, she did not view religion at, as at all out of place in the encouragement of moral duties. Quote, the wisest laws would not be sufficient to restrain men within the bounds of morality without those powerful motives which religion affords to interest the affections and enlighten the understanding, end quote. Promotion of virtue was then the guiding principle by which she judged relationships, institutions, and regimes. After all, the common good of the family and society could only be achieved were the virtuous fulfillment of each person's duties of utmost priority. Quote, a truly benevolent legislator always endeavors to make it in the interest of each individual to be virtuous, and thus private virtue becoming the cement of public happiness an orderly whole is consolidated by the tendency of all the parts toward a common center, end quote. Or as she wrote most famously, society can only be happy and free in proportion as it is virtuous. But a close corollary for Wollstonecraft is the belief that wealth, status, and power corrupted those who did not work to direct their superior status, talents, and resources to the common good, and especially the weakest and most vulnerable. She did not limit her critique to the decadent rich though, even if she believed moral corruption originated there. Wealth and property is improperly determinative of honor, 
also invested the poor in a materialistic game of imitation in which they could never make true moral progress. For this reason, Wollstonecraft came to fear the new aristocracy of wealth as much, if not more, than the aristocracy of old. Quote, if aristocracy of birth is leveled with the ground only to make room for that of riches, I'm afraid that the morals of the people will not be much improved by the change or the government rendered less, rendered less venal. The personal and societal benefits of moral development would be profound, Wollstonecraft thought. A person freed from the incessant desire to indulge one's various appetites would be more properly focused on the good of others and thus engage in a much more meritorious undertaking, benevolence. Indeed, she believed strongly that it was each person's highest end to imitate God's goodness through benevolence toward others. One's treatment of fellow human beings, whatever their social status, was the very best indicator of one's identification with God. From the lips of her protagonist in one of Wollstonecraft's short children's stories, quote, if I behave improperly to servants, I really am their inferior as I abuse trust and imitate not the being whose servant I am without a shadow of equality. But without reason directing the passions towards virtue, one's animal instincts would, quote, run wild, rendering a person impulsive, selfish, even brutal. Not governing the passions the way one should, he or she becomes a slave to those passions and thus not independent and free. Indeed, freedom, a freedom bereft of wisdom and virtue would reduce men to beasts. And this was especially true, thought Wollstonecraft, in intimate relations between men and women. The wellspring of the domestic affections she re recognized as the source of every public virtue. After all, were God's goodness not sought as the, quote, eternal rule of right, that by which we should judge all other claims of right, expediency and power would be all that remains to guide human actions. Man's arbitrary claims of power, heeding not the higher authority of God, were the source of every oppression in Wollstonecraft's view. And it was here that she made an important advance for women and other vulnerable groups, articulating an ancient truth that still admonishes today, where there no higher standard of truth or virtue, no eternal rule of right, how would one judge a law or action to be unjust? Again, without eternal right to govern human norms, persons would base their actions invariably on what most is most useful, pleasing, or convenient to them, and the weak would fall prey to the strong. Quote, for man and woman, truth, if I understand the meaning of the word, must be the same. Yet, and here she is critiquing Rousseau in particular, virtue becomes a relative idea, having no other foundation than utility. And of that utility, men pretend arbitrarily to judge, shaping it to their own convenience, end quote. Such a relativization of truth and virtue is particularly harmful in relations between men and women, given the natural and social asymmetries between them. So her aim was to set things between the sexes aright, for in doing that, the whole human race, divided as it was between the sexes, might have hope of progressing in virtue and thus finding happiness. Wollstonecraft thus wished to transform intimate relationships between men and women into those governed by mutual respect and affection. In her view, these relationships were too often manipulative and transactional, like a commercial enterprise or worse, entirely destructive of human dignity. This debasement was of great consequence and not just for the persons involved. Moral corruption of this most fundamental human relationship sowed corruption throughout the whole of society. And so it is here, in my view, that the late 18th century vindicator of the rights of women makes her most important, if unsung, contribution. In accord with her general theory of the passions, Wollstonecraft regarded sexual desire as a natural appetite, but one that needs reason and principle to govern it. As with the other passions, the sexual appetite has certain ends knowable to the intellect, ends that can be respected or thwarted. Its ends are evident in the goods that underlie the sexual act itself. It nourishes intimate affections and encourages procreation. But pleasure, a happy ancillary of the appetites and of the sexual appetites more so than the other tends to trump purpose according to Wollstonecraft. And so the sexual appetite can become quote, depraved, rendering the person impulsive and selfish rather than focused on the good of the other and so benevolent and free. Her most cogent moral aphorism is directed here, quote, cherish such a habitual respect for mankind 
as may prevent us from disgusting a fellow creature for the sake of a present indulgence. Given, a, the, given the asymmetries inherent in sex and reproduction, asymmetries that lent to the societal uh, prevalence of a sexual double standard, Wollstonecraft repeatedly condemned the quote, want of chastity in men. The grand source she writes of many of the quote, physical and moral evils that torment mankind and degrade and destroy women. Rather, she thought, if men were more self-possessed with greater respect for the well-being of women as rational creatures made in God's image, women would not feel the need to self-objectify, de uh, degrading themselves into mere objects for men's arousal. And uh, quote, I know of no other way of preserving the chastity of mankind than that of rendering women rather objects of love than desire. And yet libertine men's ill respect for both women's reproductive capacity and uh, sex's quote, parental design placed women in especially precarious situations. Forgetting the quote, noble use of sex, men with women indulge their desires, sometimes leaving women quote, too weak to carry out the maternal duties that sexual intercourse potentially sets before them. They have quote, sacrificed to lasciviousness, the parental affection that ennobles instinct. And the woman now pregnant and abandoned by her sexual partner may seek quote, either to destroy the embryo in the womb or cast it off when born, end quote. Wollstonecraft blasts the idea that humanity had come so far from the quote, barbarism of antiquity at which time parents routinely exposed children who were born but unwanted. She returned to the ends of sex implanted by nature. Quote, nature and everything demands respect, but those who violate her laws seldom violate them with impunity. Surely nature never intended that women by satisfying an appetite should frustrate the very purpose for which it was implanted. Wollstonecraft demanded instead that in situations such as these, the father maintain both mother and child. Such an expectation of paternal responsibility, she argues, might well bring an end to quote, an abuse that is an equally fatal effect on population and morals. An advocate of sexual integrity and responsible fatherhood she was, of abortion she was not. And this we ought to remember was at a time when pregnancy was far more hazardous to women and embryonic development far less understood than in our own day. Wollstonecraft believed that domestic affections, true domestic affections, man for woman and woman for man could channel sexual energies away from the pursuit of pleasure to something that could transform society itself. A man's love for his wife and children could expand his heart and so free him from narrow self-regard. Quote, the tenderness which a man will feel for the mother of his children is an excellent substitute for the ardor of unsatisfied passion. Cold would be the heart of a husband were he not rendered unnatural by early debauchery, who did not feel more delight at seeing his child suckled by its mother than the most wantful, than the most artful wanton tricks could ever raise, end quote. Indeed, engaged in attentive fatherhood was the very best means to direct men's desires profitably by, by, by bringing them into a shared, a life of shared domesticity. And given men's power and influence in society, such an orientation would yield benefits well beyond the good of his wife and children. Consider the uh, contrast, uh, how she contrasts the ill effects of the libertine man with the noble citizenship of the husband and father. Quote, from the lax morals and depraved affections of the libertine, what results? A finical man of taste who is only anxious to secure his own private gratifications and to maintain his rank in society. But the character of a husband and father forms the citizen imperceptibly, producing a sober manliness of thought and orderly behavior. The benefits of a rich domestic life for society were manifold. Quote, if you wish to make good citizens, you must first exercise the affections of a son and a brother. This is the only way to expand the heart for public affections as well as public virtue must grow, ever grow out of private character. By trading the libertine lifestyle for that first domestic affection, men and women could refine their humanity and thereby transform the world. So Wollstonecraft praised marriage in theory, but not as legally instituted and practiced in her time. It was the very potential she saw in the institution where it designed with virtue and equal dignity in mind that caused her scathing critique. 
Indeed, marriage was so essential to the domestic affections that Wollstonecraft regarded as the primary instruments of both personal and societal happiness that the moral corruption of the institution was, quote, more universally injurious to morality than all the other vices of mankind collectively considered, end quote. But a marital relationship between equals in which each was perfected by the other through their growth in the virtue of friendship had great potential. Wollstonecraft urged couples to love each other, quote, on account of their virtues. For, quote, children will never be properly educated till, till friendship subsists between parents. Virtue flies from a house divided against itself and a whole legion of devils takes up their residence there. Wollstonecraft's appeal for women's education and entry into the professions is her most remembered contribution today. Too often forgotten is her characterization of motherhood and fatherhood as that first duty of citizens. Quote, it is the indispensable duty of men and women to fulfill the duties which give birth to affections that are the surest preservations against vice, end quote. Undertaken with the intentionality and the seriousness it deserves then, the formative work of the family, later in collaboration with the children's teachers, could be a manifestation of human excellence itself, giving dignity, Wollstonecraft writes, to a common duty. Quote, the parent who endeavors to form the heart and, in, and enlarge the understanding of his child has given that dignity to the discharge of a duty common to the whole animal world. So if Wollstonecraft disagreed with Burke on some important matters, on the givenness of familial duties as the most fundamental social reality, she and Burke most heartily agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica, for your paper. That was a, that was very interesting and, and a tour de force of ideas. Um, I have uh, no doubt that many people are just like me, uh, where I thought I knew enough uh, about Wollstonecraft and where she fits in the intellectual history of the West. Uh, I had actually never read her book in full until this past weekend. Um, but I found someone in the book that I did not necessarily expect. Um, there may be many who are listening today, hearing your description and her thoughts uh, who are also realizing that Wollstonecraft may not be who they thought that she was. Uh, but you, as you have alluded to, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was a very complex figure with a very dramatic life. Before we go deeper into Wollstonecraft's thoughts on duty and virtue, perhaps we should tackle a, a little more of such a complex thinker and how you grapple with a thinker who took many, many different positions in her short life. Uh, there's a line you quote uh, from her in your paper, which you also put at the very start of your book, uh, which is, if you wish to make your son rich, pursue one course. If you are only anxious to make him virtuous, you must take another. But do not imagine that you could be bound from one road to the other without losing your way. I think this is a very excellent quote, um, but Wilson Craft seems to be bounding from one road to the next over her life. Um, do you have thoughts on her dealings with thinkers who have changed their, uh, do you have thoughts on the dealing with thinkers who have changed their thoughts multiple times in their lives, but a particular period might resonate with a reader? Yeah, so let me actually just um, answer this with regard to Wollstonecraft herself. Um, so Wollstonecraft scholars tend to see three different stages of her thought. The first focus on the education and formation of children. She actually started a school in Newington Green then her two treatises on rights, and then finally her work around and after the reign of terror, which she actually was in Paris to experience. And that late period also corresponds with some ra rather dramatic uh, uh, personal matters in her life, the cruel abandonment of her first child's father, and then two suicide attempts, um, and before dying in childbirth, her marriage to Godwin. So given all this, one can understand how easy it is to focus on her dramatic life as many have done uh, since, you know, especially Godwin's biography, I think. But is one like myself more interested in competing theories of women's rights that in, than in Wollstonecraft, the historical figure, um, my book and my work focuses on her early and middle thought, you could say before, it seems to me this kind of pain filled despair maybe about the capacity of human beings to live according to their lofty nature, which she uh, spells out in the rights of women um, before that kind of sets in. So I just um, have two quotes kind of put side by side. So those who aren't familiar with her work can kind of get the transition um, from kind of early and middle to late. So consider 
um, this, uh, this strong Aristotelian language um, concerning kind of apparent goods in her mid-career rights of woman. She says, it, might, it may be confidently asserted that no man chooses evil because it is evil. He only mistakes it for happiness, the good he seeks. But then, uh, you know, just several years later in the months leading up to the reign of terror, she writes very differently in a letter regarding the state of the French nation, quote, I am not become an atheist, I assure you, by residing in Paris. Yet I began to fear that vice, or if you will, evil, is the grand mobile of action. So I think it's pretty clear that <laughs> as she sees kind of the reign of, of terror in front of her, she begins to, you know, lose faith in achieving moral progress, especially through political reform. But she also realized, I think, in her personal life that she had fallen for precisely the kind of man about whom she had warned others in her rights of woman. Um, and, and the unjust laws of marriage at the time, had she even acceded to them, would have done nothing to protect her. So there's a kind of despairing, I think, in her later thought, especially about uh, the state of things for women that seems to be, I don't know, pretty easy to uh, explain given the time of history in which she lived and really the personal suffering she endured. And I haven't even described her kind of difficult childhood. <laughs> so I mean, I guess regarding all this, I would say, but for the grace of God, go I. <laughs> um, that said, there are several currents that run throughout her work, one of which I really focus in on. Um, at the end of her life, she wrote not a promised treatise on law, which is supposed to be kind of the second you know, piece to the rights of women, but rather small books of guidance for young women on pregnancy, childbirth, care of infants, and one with these uh, domestic scenes to be used for the intellectual and moral formation of her daughter. So though her views on these other very important matters changed, the kind of importance of a rich domestic life represented, I think, kind of a singular um, devotion. And, and Erica, uh, also, thank you for your paper. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. And, and uh, I was like Chris in that uh, before this weekend, I hadn't read Wollstonecraft. I thought I had. <laughs> I thought I had read it a long time ago when I was studying, but I realized uh, that I hadn't. Uh, she is just someone who uh, I, I, I know that's in the pantheon of, of intellectual history. Uh, and likewise, thought that I uh, thought that I knew where she fit, mainly because of how perhaps she's been received uh, in uh, the past, maybe for the past 30, 40, 50 years, is there's, there's a bit of a reinterest in, in her. But uh, what really surprised me, it goes to what you just mentioned, uh, is that is her Aristotelianism. But the quote that you just referenced with respect to seeking knowledge and also not, uh, not always seeking the good in believing that you're choosing the good. I mean, that's that's directly from, <laughs> it's almost a direct quote uh, from Aristotle and certainly re-echoes in, in Thomas. Uh, but I guess what I'm getting to is she's not an individualist. Uh, and, and this is what really surprised me in reading uh, the book. Uh, she, she seems to live on in the echoes of intellectual history as an individualist. So, so I throw this back to you as, is, is this just my misunderstanding because I haven't read her before or did something develop so that the received understanding and appreciation of her has turned her into some, mm. in, an individualist of sorts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that she, it's been, you know, the, the great work, kind of heroic work that um, political theorists have done over the last about 20 years has been, um, has really disabused many of us who have actually, you know, been then going back to read her after reading the secondary literature and seeing, you know, there's still sort of, you know, different views about her, the, the main thrust of her work, but um, in general, a lot, most see her as this kind of Aristotelian. So I think that, you know, the main thing that happened was this, this biography that Godwin threw out into the public within, you know, very, very close after her death. And he pushed, he kept like her sisters out of it. He really wanted to write it how he wanted to write it. And, um, you know, so he plays up and sort of makes ambiguous particular relationships that she has that makes her look more scandalous, I think, than, you know, she did have dramatic things happen in her life, a lot of heartbreak, I think, with this, the first, um, um, you know, spouse, her first husband. Um, but, um, you know, she, she also, he also plays down uh, the parts of her, um, her thought that he didn't like, which he admitted he didn't like, and he never understood her religiosity at all. And so there's, you know, that part, which, you know, undergirds her rights claim is, is lost for this time. 
So I think, you know, that's, and she also uses some language um, that, you know, Payne used, Locke used, um, rights of man, natural rights. It's not as much as you would think in there, but it's in there. And so I think that's part of why she's understood that way. I think what's really fascinating in the intellectual history, um, and that's what I kind of try to uncover in this new book, is that the early American women's rights advocates understood her really well. So they read her, they passed, you know, the rights of women around, they published it in, you know, the revolution, uh, one of the main newspapers. Um, and when, um, you know, the first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls in 1848, they think of sexual equality very much in Wollstonecraftian terms on, quote, identity of race and capacities and responsibilities. And they even have some resolutions, which, you know, demands that men and women are both held up to this single moral standard. But then what happens in the women's rights movements is that, um, you know, there's this, this trade, you know, Wollstonecraft's kind of prioritization of the virtuous fulfillment of familial and social obligations, which is, again, the foundation for rights, is traded in for Locke's more individualistic conception of rights. And I go into how that kind of happens um, in my book. But also in the decades following John Stuart Mill's subjection of women, um, you know, there's an entirely different than approach to liberty, right? It's transformed from this means to virtuously fulfill these given obligations and in relationship um, in Wollstonecraft's thought to this kind of just essential human capacity with no particular goal or end. So in Mill's telling, you know, elites aren't supposed to direct their goods toward the common good, but rather to engage creatively in experiments of living, regardless of kind of the downstream effects on the more disadvantaged. And then when, so Mill then eclipses Wollstonecraft in women's rights thought. And so then we sort of think back like, oh, they're all of a piece when there's really these dramatic kind of lines um, in, in um, that, you know, can be traced in the intellectual history. Well, and I, I think that's a, that the, the last few thoughts you had there are very important because Mill does seem to be a pivot when we put Wollstonecraft in this line. And as you noted earlier, the secondary literature uh, treats her in many different ways. Uh, so the, as you say, the Wol Wollstonecraft scholars seem to recognize the Aristotelianism when she's just put in the background of history and mentioned and referenced. Yeah. And what I realized as I, uh, leading up to this and in discussions with you, that that's, that's where my impression of, I thought I knew Wollstonecraft was. I think it comes from the secondary literature where she, she, she sometimes looms large in the past thinking about a line, um, but that line does have, it does seem to have this pivot in Mill and, and she's, she's out of juncture with, with, with him. It, it certainly seems to me, um, but uh, Chris. You know. sure, yeah, as we've been discussing, Wollstonecraft uh, comes at a very interesting crossroads uh, of intellectual history. Um, she is living through uh, the capstone era of the enlightenment with reason uh, brought back forcefully uh, even to the point of deification of reason, of capital R reason in Paris. Um, but even in her own country of England, uh, the liberalism of the Enlightenment that might be said to trace back to Hobbes and the flowers in Locke and becomes more flowery in Rousseau uh, had already set down deep roots in discarding a shared nature. Uh, what is driving Wollstonecraft at this point in her life to make a common shared nature uh, between men and women so central, uh, because it seems she's not just bucking a trend uh, of thinking that men had greater capacity for virtue than women by arguing both men and women are equally uh, capable of developing virtue, but she is also arguing for a radical equality of all humans despite gender, class, or race through our shared nature. Yeah, so I think this really comes back to her natural theology. So if you kind of discard that and you're telling of who she is, you know, as Godwin, you know, may have done, um, you know, there's, you kind of miss where that radical equality lies. So obviously, she, you know, she definitely sees natural inequalities in human beings and strength, intelligence, all sorts of other things. She certainly sees natural inequalities or, or uh, merit inequalities and virtue too. Um, but as you say, there is this radical equality in their utter dependence upon and responsibility to God. So she... So the way I kind of put it is that she shared the ancient view of human excellence as imitative of God, but then sought to universalize this human quest beyond the landed classes by recognizing this basic dignity in each person. But really importantly, um, hers is a dignity with a telos. So yes, we have dignity by virtue of simply being human, but our rational and social nature directs us toward particular ways of living 
that enable us to live up to that given dignity. It's the very kind of antithesis of the Hobbesian account of radical equality where every human, sorry, every you know, natural duty is rejected and equality between men and women um, is based on our low ability to kill each other. Um, and so this is why for Wollstonecraft, education is so central, right? So regardless of sex, class, or race, all are due a particular kind of education, an intellectual and moral formation to enable us to actualize our potencies, though she doesn't use that language, um, of our shared rational nature. So she writes um, the beginning of, of the rights of women, ignorant beings uh, not taught to respect the public good nor allowed any civil rights will attempt to do themselves justice by retaliation, end quote. And this is where uh, I think what, you know, she thinks basically what had unfolded in the French Revolution. Here were beings who were kept in ignorance for so long that they knew not how to use their freedom virtuously. And so they acted like beasts, which is very much from her, from her, life, from her uh, work. Yeah. I also think that the points that you just made, that she re referenced the lack of a, a telos uh, that uh, was lost perhaps. And uh, it, I, th I think it was beginning to be lost a bit before her time, but it's certainly in the 19th century, uh, the, the major trend of thinkers uh, in uh, liberalism lost it. And Mill, as you noted, lost the, the point of ends, both to acts and to society and, and just to who we are. So with that in mind, she has, uh, of course, a, a very strong sense of the ends of society, the ends of a human participation in community. And uh, although this is not going to be very uh, um, crisp uh, Aristotelianism, as I'll describe it, the, uh, the, the many different ends and, 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 and shorter ends uh, that we might have that may lead ultimately to uh, a final end. Uh, so, so, so one of the points I, I, I'd like to see if you could talk a little bit more about is, is the notion of participation in community as it pertains to her identity uh, or her sense of self, because it, at this point in her life, she does not exhibit a notion of autonomy. Uh, again, somewhat perhaps what the secondary literature might be thinking that she's proposing and perhaps Godwin might be influencing uh, as, as a, a received understanding of her uh, occurs. But her sense of self is not bound in herself, in her ego and in an I. Her sense of identity is social and, and in community. So she defines her life, as, a, as I read her book, in relation to others, uh, she not not in, not as herself as her, obviously there's a individual flourishing that happens in general human flourishing but it's always directed outwards and the development of virtue is social in in context so perhaps i'm stretching it a bit but if i put it in my own words it, it's as if she is not mary wollstonecraft except in active participation in community i'm not ryan unless i'm yeah. Uh, an active participation community and Erica and Chris are not themselves either, uh, unless in community. So it, could you comment a little bit on that or, or, or if I'm pushing her concepts too far, just let me know. Yeah, no, I mean, I think if, you know, if uh, she certainly talks about independence, as I mentioned, but her view of independence is very much and freedom too are, you know, very much with virtue um, as, as guide and with duties, you know, toward, toward doing the good. Um, so if, if autonomy is being basically a law unto oneself, it's definitely something that Wollstonecraft rejects. She very clearly understands that we are first and foremost in relation to and dependent upon God, and that all human goods are but a, quote, shadow of his attributes here below. Um, and so that most fundamental relation then connects us all through this interchange of interweaving obligations and affections. And so our identity is definitely always relational and moves outward. And this is, I think, important too from domestic relations and obligations and affections toward the public identity. So daughter, wife, mother, citizen, but also son, husband, father, citizen, probably some professional in there somewhere too. But relationality is not just for women, right? So this is another place where she kind of corrects the enlightenment thinkers. And it of course has an impact on feminism. If you follow Hobbes, Locke and Mill, 
you get women's rights advocates seeking to make women more like mythical autonomous men, right? Liberal citizens. But if you follow Wollstonecraft, you can begin to reimagine rights born of the natural duties we owe one another, which is a very different way to think about rights. Uh, yeah, this then leads us back to the common good. Um, a common theme, theme among our guests' uh, comments have been that the common good, while it's difficult to define, uh, everyone agrees that it is important, um, but the common good can't seem to be achieved with a strictly rights-based culture. Um, starting with rights um, seems to be starting with the self, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any self that isn't social, as we've just discussed. Uh, when the priority is always I as myself. Uh, it's difficult uh, to see the common good arising. However, your paper has significant discussion of rights. Um, how does that fit in with your conception of the common good? Yeah, so I think, um, and I, I mean, this is very much what I believe, and I think this is thoroughgoing in, in Wollstonecraft too, as I just mentioned, but we're not first and foremost, these kind of autonomous beings with rights, right? Where rather beings in, I mean, this is just kind of common sense. It seems to me that we're in, you know, we're beings in concrete and particular relation with one another and with concrete in particular duties um, to one another and affections for one another. And I think if we begin to see rights as kind of the flip side of obligations, so basically what others are due, then we're better able to give kind of priority to these natural ties to one another, our need for independence upon one another and it seems to me in um, you know, my reading of Aristotle and Thomas on the common good that interdependence is really, I think the foundation for the concept of the common good, right? So individual persons are not self-sufficient to be so one would be either a beast or a God, Aristotle says, right? We need, each of us needs the nurture and care of a family and families or households cannot exist on their own, right? They need the common, the, the goods common to the city. And so we are, because of this basic interdependence with one another, we're parts of greater wholes. And this is not to say we as parts are swallowed up by the whole, which of course is this kind of constant misunderstanding of the common good, but that our proper good can only come about through being part of this larger whole, not some abstract whole, but concrete whole. I mean, I think um, the best example of this is you know, a flourishing family, um, you know. Well, and that, and that I think, Erica, is, uh, is, is a very important point, which we have talked a little bit about in this conversation series, but we have not delved too deeply. We, we, we had a, a talk that was very good uh, in describing partnerships of partnerships uh, in, uh, in, this, in society as you, as you described, uh, starting with the family as a basic unit and then moving to your local community and then however the, the jurisdiction, the political authority might be, might be set up. And so that's a, it's a little bit of my inartful uh, earlier comment of shorter ends that lead right. further and further to longer ends. But it, in, the, it, in most in Kreft's writings, and I saw this of, of course in, in your paper and Thank you for some advanced, uh, advanced peek of your book, which I highly recommend to, 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 to folks. And we have a, we have a link uh, to it. There is a much more immediate concern uh, that she has. And that is of course, between uh, man and woman, between husband and wife. And she has a few lines, which uh, really struck me about friendship because this does echo into many other parts of our discussion on the common good that might ultimately lead to questions about law and the state and, and so forth, where we need to treat others as ourselves, uh, as, 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 sorry, as other selves uh, for friendship, and that the law ultimately has a goal of friendship. But she starts uh, first by talking about husband and wives, uh, not as uh, a, a wife being inferior to uh, a husband, uh, but as being friends. And in the Aristotelian sense that she is talking about, which Aristotle may not have agreed with her on this part, you know, but but at least as she's using the Aristotelian thoughts, that's uh, that means a certain equality of friendship and each other treating each other as an other self and as a, as a friend 
so, 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 yeah. any comments on on that? Yeah, no, it's funny because it's actually it's one of the parts of the secondary literature I find most amusing. Some people love this in her, um, but others, yeah. you know, think like she, you know, she sacrifices the ardor of passion for the calm of friendship and marriage. And I think like, this is great. You know, this is a beautiful, wonderfully edifying vision of marriage. Um, and yes, of course, it's one between equals. Um, and, you know, one that I think is importantly, I think this probably came out in my paper, but where it sees its shared work in the development of virtue in each other and in the children. So in one of the coolest parts, and I don't have the quote in front of me, but where she talks about like in nurture, nurturing and in building up virtue in children, we see that, you know, God has designed it so that we're actually developing in virtue ourselves, which as a mother of many children is absolutely true, you know, <laughs> whether I like it or not. Um, uh, but, you know, one of the things, too, that I like that also maps on to some things I like in, in Thomas, even though, again, as you say, he probably didn't, wouldn't agree exactly with um, the lack of hierarchy here, um, where, you know, the, she leaves a lot of the details. I mean, she talks about motherhood and fatherhood um, and this friendship between them, but she leaves a lot of kind of the details um, to what, you know, in Thomistic language, you could say is domestic prudence. Um, which I really think is, is beautiful, you know, that they have to work these things out um, in friendship together, um, which is what I think is a really beautiful model of, of marriage today, too. Well, I, I, I'd like to think Thomas would, would agree wholeheartedly with, with that. Um, uh, yeah. Aristotle yeah. might not, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but no, that's, I think that's a, those are some really beautiful thoughts uh, as well. And that also what you discussed about virtue development and formation and, and that, that is so important that uh, even though virtue is something that we try to achieve as individuals, as, as, as individual persons, and we are individuated in that sense, uh, but we can't do it on our own. We, 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 we have to do, we have to develop virtue uh, in community, socially pointed towards others and formation occurs also. It's very hard to form yourself um, uh, and, and I, I know you've, you've been involved in developing a, a school uh, which, uh, which focuses on formation of character and formation of, of, of virtues. Uh, and and uh, perhaps in, uh, we're going a little bit off Wollstonecraft here for a moment, but, but this, this is sort of leading into your own thoughts uh, uh, where Wollstonecraft might be in the background. But what, what, what education in general and, and children, uh, how does all of that fit in with the, with the common good? Yeah, no, I mean, to me, it seems like the most basic place um, where we should think about what, you know, when people say, well, what's the common good? And it seems to me that the, the first place we should go is to the, to the family, to a, to a you know, well-functioning, well-flourishing family that sees its end um, as Wilson Craft would, as, you know, the virtuous development of persons. So I think in a good family, each person is responsible to and for one another and making sure that each person's unique needs are met, right? And so, but in the process of all that, of being responsible to and for um, others, you know, big people being responsible for little and little trying their best to help out and all that, each family member is there by shaping their own character and, you know, kind of imperceptibly as she uses that language, right? Growing in this virtuous disposition for willing the good of others, right? Because if virtue is a habit, I mean, that's where it's learned is right there in the family with those kind of um, those friendships that are built and, you know, the quarrels and all those kinds of things that come to pass that it's, we're all, or, you know, we have all got the oars going in the right, in the same direction um, toward the development of virtue. And, and so, and the parents are of course steering, you know, the ship, but they're developing in virtue with each other, with the, you know, with the family. And I think it's a beautiful way of thinking about the common good while each individual you know, their own proper good is very much being um, uplifted and developed and, um, and met through, through that, because what's their proper good? I mean, ultimately, it's to develop in virtue in order to obtain, you know, um, a happy life. So I think the family is a really, is a really great place to start. Do, do you have any, uh, since we're running close to time, do, do you have any closing thoughts in general, Wollstonecraft, duty, yeah. virtue, the common good, right, large, happy to hear them? I have very, very much enjoyed um, listening to the series. I've learned a great deal, um, have been reading more and more in this area. Um, but I, you know, I do, I, I guess what I would, would add is just to build off what you were just saying is, is, you know, Aristotle's recognition that the city is necessary for households to flourish. Mm -hmm. And so that's why law and politics is so important, important for the family, if the family is the basic you know, the basic, uh, where the common good um, is, you know, 
you know, most, I think, uh, best manifest where you can sort of see it in concrete that even the family very much needs the common good of the city. And that's why law and politics with regard to the family is so important um, to make sure that that most fundamental unit um, is, is able to flourish um, through all sorts of ways. You know, we don't wanna put roadblocks in the way because they can't, you know, people can't afford families. And there's all sorts of discussions like that in, in the United States right now. So I think those are really important because of this important work of, mm -hmm. of the family and helping, um, helping children and, and adults to flourish. Well, thank you very much. And we appreciate you participating in this uh, a, a virtual event at Oxford, uh, and uh, and we appreciate you uh, being part of our advisors. Thank so, you. Thank so you. Much. Take care.